And first speaker, talking on the returns on innovation, what the NHS needs is Jim Easton from the Department of Health, who, as he himself says, has, directed his, has uh, demonstrated his title of Director for Improvement and Efficiency by arriving just in time to give his talk. <laughs> Jim Easton. Thank you, Chairman. I'd have, uh, I'd have had a line if I was late as well. Um, it's great to um, be able to speak to you, uh, speak to you all. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to speak for about uh, 15 minutes and then leave time for um, questions. I know many of you, for those who don't, um, I'm a, an NHS um, lifer. Um, I've been a hospital chief executive and a strategic health authority chief executive. I'm currently the person who leads the work in the NHS on um, finding £20 billion of efficiencies while seeking to improve quality, for which um, it turns out innovation is quite important. And I'm going to say, um, 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 uh, give a couple of examples of that and uh, say why this is important for the country, things you already know, and the political profile. I'm going to um, offer a, a challenge to the um, biomedical industry briefly. Um, and I'm going to talk about the challenge we face and in particular the publication of the Chief Executive's Review of Innovation, which I, it was designed to be anyway a pivotal moment in taking this work forward. So something about... Um, the environment, um, well, in a sense, the English NHS is um, uh, experiencing an, an acute exacerbation of the chronic problem of all healthcare systems in the world, which is their growing unaffordability. Um, so, uh, as a result of economics that you know about, um, we're in the middle of um, uh, trying to face up to effectively continuing to provide an NHS of improving quality against a background of relatively flat cash. Uh, it, with some allowance for inflation, all sorts of political arguments about what the actual level of growth is, but pretty much from a flat resource envelope, needing to cope with growth in volume and new technologies. That's an incredibly difficult thing it, by international standards and coming off the back of a long period of growth. But it is, of course, a precursor to the uh, medium and long term position of all healthcare systems around the world. Healthcare systems are consuming a greater um, share of the GDP of their host countries each year. That's an unsustainable position. That's an unsustainable position. No one knows quite when it breaks. The US seems to have got itself into a terrific problem around 18% of its G GDP on um, healthcare, so it would take us a while to catch up with there. But all healthcare systems are on a route to unaffordability. So the deep medium term problem that we face together is one of how you innovate to produce benefits to patients, new treatments, but also ones that are um, affordable. And the two messages there for me, for obviously for myself, but also for you as an industry, is first of all, what is there in the innovation pipeline that drives both uh, better care and affordability? And secondly, that you, like we, need to change our mindsets around what innovation means. And we have to focus on both of those issues. And so we have to both drive gains in the basic modalities of treatment in terms of um, cures and relief and all that kind of stuff that you think so much about, and they have to be affordable. Um, in essence, um, for healthcare systems around the world, for us particularly now, but for healthcare systems around the world for the future, the way that we pay for innovation is by those innovations saving money. That's the way we will pay for innovation. It is unsustainable for all healthcare systems to pay for innovations by consuming greater proportions of GDP. Now, of course, that's the same as every business in the world, effectively, but it's relatively new in healthcare, um, where in many healthcare systems, including ours, um, the task, whether you're running the NHS or running innovation, is to find out where the money is, get your snout in the trough, and see if you can attract some to the good thing that you're promoting, whether that's in my case things like reduced waiting times or new hospitals or in your case some fantastic new biomedical innovation. For both of us that game at some level is dead and for us to do the things we need to do we have to change our mindset to delivering both quality and value so that we can produce the money to, for the innovations we want. I think it's a profound mindset change. It's a profound mindset change for many people working in healthcare. Uh, and I think for many people in the um, innovation and supplier industries um, as well. Um, in some senses, that can be a very negative frame. It's a slightly, um, it's very difficult. But it's also, um, of course, the mother of invention. I mean, it's a, it's a situation in which we have to, for the first time, be deeply serious about um, 
innovation if we're to survive. You, there is no analysis of the situation that suggests that we can maintain a universal healthcare system by effectively running the things the way we do today. There is no analysis, credible analysis, that suggests that. In fact, those analyses run out very quickly. Uh, and the only credible analysis suggests that you have to innovate significantly in some of the, the full range from, you know, right at the end of um, advanced medical science right through to some of the boring mechanics of running systems. Right the way through there, you need innovation. So the time is right. But that, that's, that's the context. In terms of what that means for you as an industry and for us, I think it's um, slightly understating it, really. Um, it, it, you know, that's, a, that's, again, a significant change of the way we run our business together. Let me suggest, first of all, um, slightly rudely, I think the challenge for you, which I've mentioned, which is um, that the biomedical industry has to make has to have as much focus on the affordability of its innovations as on the medical gain. Because without that, they can't be afforded. Um, the good news is I think there's a lot in your pipeline that potentially achieves it, but it's, um, it's under-realized. So most of our innovations are additive to the system. What we do is we find some clever new thing and we add it to our system. And because we add it and we don't strip out the old system and we're not disciplined about making that innovation stick, we end up with the costs of both the old and the new. And because of that, it creates a culture, particularly in NHS leadership, of which I've been a part, that innovation is expensive. And therefore, the system creates antibodies to innovation. So it's an additive model that does lead to, to more uh, costs of both in the system and, and the under-realisation of the quality benefits. Um, and uh, therefore uh, barriers are put up by the system. So my, my challenge to you, which is the smaller of the two challenges, is how you refresh your thinking about the role of biomedical innovation to think at least as much about the affordability of your innovation and how we release the value to pay for it as you do about the basic medical gain. And I think this is true internationally and those healthcare systems and their partners that begin to make progress on this will be the ones that lead internationally over the next 20 years because all healthcare systems have to get the hang of this problem. But I recognise in saying that and obviously my main focus is on challenges for us. The NHS is a very interesting thing, it, it's sort of a national treasure. Um, I regard it as fundamentally important to the social fabric of our society, that we have a universal healthcare system. I hope you, many of you feel that way too. But it won't be protected by treating it as a national treasure. It will be protected by um, being brave about how it needs to change in order to survive. And it's no good simply spouting words about the importance of innovation because we have to um, accept that the NHS, whilst includes many, many brilliant innovators and inventors, the NHS has a fantastic track record of being the sort of organisational home of many people and uh, organisations who are capable of invention. It's a very, very poor system of the adoption of that innovation. Your experience will have been that the NHS is a complex, confusing custom with hundreds of entry points. Um, often, it seems to me, for the reasons I suggested, largely set up to see innovation as a problem to be put off rather than something to be hungrily adopted. I've been part of that system. So we've, been, uh, we've taken that rather unpleasant look in the mirror uh, and if we make the point about needing to change then we have to face up to what that change actually is. And that will come to fruition fairly quickly and uh, many of you have contributed to the work that uh, Serene Carruthers has led on behalf of Sir David Nicholson, the Chief Executive's Review of Innovation and that I expect to be published probably around the beginning of December. Um, quite a high profile uh, and will set out some pretty deep changes about how we intend um, to change the way the NHS works in order to be a much more rapid adopter and diffuser of those innovations which deliver both quality and value. Now that leaves me in a slightly awkward position and the one thing I, I uh, mustn't do is pre-announce um, anything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, but let me, um, let me offer some um, hints from the things that you've contributed to that review which I think um, are, are informative of the way it will um, come out. Firstly, uh, timidity 
about diffusion of innovation. I think it's a fair comment that the NHS has apparently this feature of being an integrated system and therefore ought to be the perfect place to diffuse innovation quickly. But when you try and do that, it turns into hundreds of different organisations and individuals, all with different interests, who all individually resist the adoption of that innovation from a range of reasons, ranging from my community, the kind of management community, worried about cost and complexity, through to interesting issues about the individual autonomy of clinicians um, and what they mean. Well, one of the things that we will, that's been said to us very strongly, and we will set out I believe with more courage and explicitness than we've done before is that where we think an innovation matters to better care and better value in our system, we will implement it. Implementation is an interesting word for us in a, the world of diffusion and so on, but we'll implement it. We have a lot of levers at our disposal. The money um, is a significant lever. The rules of the game, the standards that go into contracts, uh, the tariffs, the way we excite and encourage our leaders, and we I think in that review we'll set out how we intend to deploy those together in a focused way to um, disseminate those innovations that really make a difference. And we will name some of them and say why they matter and lose this timidity. It does leave us with a, a problem, which is, I, in my simple brain, I, I think of as the hopper problem. So if we're redesigning our machinery for how to diffuse innovation with much more rigour and seriousness and follow through and incentives than we have before, it presupposes the question that we've made good decisions about what innovation to disseminate. Um, and I think that is a complicated problem and we need help. We need help from the best and the brightest in the innovation community and academia and our own professions about if we're going to be less timid about diffusion, which, I'm sorry, I'm mixing metaphors at a rate of knots here, which, which horses should we back? in that race. Not a simple problem for me. As the National Director for Improvement, I get, uh, I guess, 10 emails a week from people who say they've solved the problem for me. Um, and they all involve me spending £100 million. And some of them will be right. Um, and it's hard uh, to know which. So again, a specific request for your expertise, which is, as we try and, re as we try and significantly re engineer the levers under a hand. And these are the, liver, these are the levers, of course, in case you're sceptical. I have no... Uh, scepticism is fine. Uh, I hope not cynicism, but scepticism is fine. These are the levers that delivered the transformations in the NHS that we focused on that took us from two-year waiting to um, um, six-week waiting, you know, that um, obliterated MRSA. We're just deciding to apply those levers and the new ones in the reform package to these issues. So when the, NH the NHS is slow sometimes to get moving, when it decides to focus on an issue, it has a track record of delivery. It's never decided to focus on these issues before, and we're trying to do it. So I understand um, some of the scepticism, but we are we're serious. And in case it helps as well, we're under a lot of pressure from number 10, who care about your industry very much, and rightly so, and want to, want to see the symbiotic relationship of the world's largest uh, integrated healthcare system and uh, the UK base of... Uh, biosciences in the related industries working symbiotically, not in a way in which largely detracts value from each other. So both determination in the NHS and, uh, and number 10. But we need your help, help with, the, um, with the, the, the hopper problem of how to discriminate. We also need to make sure that in the new landscape that's emerging in the NHS, we don't move from having um, 300 potential customers to having 1,000. And there are a number of people who are anxious that in the landscape that the reform package creates, it's going to be even more difficult to find entry points for key innovations. And again, we'll say something more about that in the innovation review, but the, thing, the things that have been said to us are we actually have unrealised innovation systems. They are the systems that are built around the specialist centres and the hospitals and primary care systems around them. Um, and the, the fact that they exist in sort of people's minds but aren't used as vehicles and aren't incentivized as vehicles for the active transmission of new products and services is an unrealized benefit and we'll be paying um, some significant attention to that. We're also making sure that as we create the local interest um, of um, clinical commissioning groups focused there on localism, although there may be fewer of those than people originally speculated on when many of those 
GPs and their colleagues locally think about the scale they need to do their business, they're, they're increasingly thinking about larger scale. And even then, there are a whole range of things that they won't be able to do individually. And this emergence of a number, I got in trouble for saying on video um, two weeks ago what I thought the number was, I'm going to avoid that today, um, a number of highly professionalised commissioning support organisations supporting groups of CCGs. One of the expertises of those has to be this business of identifying those solutions which will make a difference and getting them implemented across their patch. So it will not be two to three hundred clinical commissioning groups. It will be a much, much smaller number of specialist commissioning um, support organisations who we will ask to support this task of identifying and spreading key innovations on the commissioning side. And on the provider side, in addition to this stuff around the academic uh, centres, we're also beginning to see coming out of the ground scale on the provider side. The last 10 years were about your independence. You know, I worked hard to create an independent trust in York. Next door to me, people worked hard to create an independent foundation trust in Harrogate. I think one of the themes that will happen as those trusts think about the economics of their business, and it's happening now, is they'll start to come together to create scale in the provider industry to do things. Some of that will be geographic, although generally in geographies people hate each other uh, and are in, uh, in competition. Um, and more often than not it will be communities of interest coming together to create scale, to do some boring things like um, back office systems on HR and legal services, um, IT systems, but also to do some more exciting things about procurement, um, innovation and quality. And we will try and find ways, not for us to dictate that from the new commissioning board, but we will try and find ways of innovating it, uh, of supporting it and encouraging it. Um, nudge is the new phrase, um, isn't it, um, in, the, in the lexicon of change. So um, it's, uh, it's a moment, is what I would say. Um, the reason it's real is because the economics are real. Um, it's not about political whim. It's not about bright ideas. The economics are uh, unavoidable, um, worsening rather than improving on a macro level. Healthcare is at the heart of those economics in every developed country, and every developed, and every developed country's healthcare system is currently sleepwalking towards unaffordability. In one sense, we're lucky to have a short-term funding crisis because it forces us up to the issue. I meet many colleagues in other developed countries who know this issue is coming but think it might be a decade away and think they can keep growing their current model until the point it reaches a crisis. So one of the things we'd like to do is harness this short-term problem. So the economics are real and unavoidable and we'll buy it with our, are biting with us and we'll buy it everywhere. Secondly, we believe that's an opportunity as well as a huge problem. It's an opportunity to drive change. Um, and we, we don't have an analysis that uh, achieves that without the application of innovation. Thirdly, we're going to try and create the machinery to do that in a way that's much more serious than before and lines up the levers of money, power, accountability, leadership behind the task of innovation. The NHS Commissioning Board is given a legal duty to innovate, to which we'll be held to account by Parliament. It's not a trivial matter for us. The economics and the duty together make it serious. And fourthly, we therefore need to change our behaviour together as an industry. There are mindset issues about linking quality and value. There are issues about how we know what to put into the hopper, which horses um, to back. Um, and uh, there are issues about being not timid, whilst recognising the issues of professional autonomy and all that kind of stuff. Not being timid about those things that will make a difference for our patients. So um, it's a good time to be optimistic. It's a weird thing. I'm incredibly optimistic, but I think that every moment of it will be sheer bloody pain. It's a slightly, um, it's a slightly strange feeling, but I think it might be right. And um, this is a point at which I think, in the sweep of things, the healthcare industry uh, around the world catches up with the rest of the world's industries and understands that it has to harness its, its intellectual power to innovate to its basic task of creating high-quality affordable health care for the citizens of the world and um, that's, a, that's a shared endeavour that's worth taking part in. Shall I, shall I stop there and um, duck any questions that you want to um, um, ask me, Chairman? Some of you will know that um, last year I think it was that this, the organisation that lives in this building, the Academy of Medical Sciences, 
um, drew up a, a complete new framework for research governance uh, in this country. And I thought the most interesting thing about uh, that document, from my point of view, was not so much reading the new proposals, which were, which were excellent, but reading the way that the old system worked, or the existing system worked, for, NH, uh, for research inside the NHS. And frankly, the, what struck me was remarkable, not was that um, how much is done in the NHS or how that, that more isn't done in the NHS, but any was done at all in the NHS. So um, arcane and baroque uh, are the systems that you have to go through to get anything done. So uh, I think this is a sort of parallel problem inside the, the NHS, and, and no doubt um, with improvement and efficiency on the, uh, on the job, we shall, we shall get there in the end. But anyway, um, questions or comments for, for Jim Easton? Do you mind saying who you are so I can write your name in my book? Okay, so I, I'm Lars Sanser, but I work in the academic sector for, for Bristol University. I was intrigued by your comment that what happens in innovation in the NHS gets cascaded down to 100, 200 organizations and then try and look at how you implement this. I've never worked in the NHS. What's always struck me, it's kind of odd, is that you have a sort of devolved structure that deals with intellectual property. And I've always come, had the impression that the NHS regards intellectual property as something it needs to defend rather than exploit. So I mean, you, you may not be able to say that, but you sort of hinted that this was something you were going to try and tackle yeah, in the yeah. paper. Can you comment any more on how um, it might be done? No. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry to be caught. I mean, I'm in one of those sort of slightly awkward positions where I, the meeting I was left was the meeting with David Nicholson signing off the Innovation Review, which you know is associated with things the Prime Minister may be going to say. So it's. I'm in a slightly awkward position, but those are the issues that we are grappling with. And we do have a paradoxical attitude to um, innovation, our intellectual knowledge. And we are very confused about what exploitation means and in whose benefit. And we're very confused about when does the NHS exist and when does it, when does it not. Um, and we're trying to make some sense. Now, we've been very... The thing to see when we see the Innovation Review is we've been trying to be selective about judgments about what will make a difference. I mean, we were fantastic, hundreds of ideas were selected, and our test is what will make the difference. So it's not an attempt to be comprehensive about every single thing you do, but to be very clear about some things we are going to do with the levers under our hands uh, and make a difference. I, I recognise the point. Yes, sir. Uh, no. Lyle Tarasenko, although we do know each other. Um, and we've talked about this before, but I was wondering whether you could say something whether the Innovation Review will address this. And indeed, as the Royal Academy of Engineering, we submitted something to the Innovation Review on this, which is really the story of um, um, the amount of evidence you have to supply to support innovation. So the case in point is a whole system demonstrator that was started by the previous government, 2006, contracts exchanged 2007, and then... I don't know who, but some mandarins in the Department of Health were persuaded, should we say, by some clinical colleagues that they ought to reverse engineer a randomized control trial into the whole system demonstrator so that we still don't have the results. They have promised for the end of this month. I'm not they sure are. that they are coming out now. Are. But effectively, the contracts were placed in 2007. As you know, we were involved with the mobile, health demonstra mobile phone demonstrator, new MPCT. In fact, the technology that will be reported on will be obsolete twice. Yeah. By the time the, the, the evidence comes out uh, in MedTech, which is where most people in this room are from, um, the technology may be obsolete. Will, will the review address that? Yeah, so, uh, in two ways, I think, Lionel. Um, so I've lived through some of that pain with you. Um, evidence is a very interesting issue in regard to healthcare and innovation. It's probably, so this is a layperson's view. It's probably a good thing that medicine is relatively conservative in terms of interventions that may kill you, which a lot of interventions could do. And so for me, I'd probably quite like there to be a high standard of evidence for some of those things. Um, we extend that um, to uh, applying sometimes the same standards of evidence to a whole range of other things which could bring benefit. Certainly when I, um, I started this job and I talked to leaders of other industries about how they deal with quality and value, and they said, what are you doing? I said, we're looking at the evidence. And they said, well, you must be mad because the problem will move faster than you do. Um, particularly if it's evidence-based. So we'll do two things. Firstly, we will publish the whole system demonstrator results, which are excellent, and, it, and one of the conclusions I personally, without prejudging the report, hope we reach from that is driving a revolution in self-care for people using mobile technology is something, one of the things that we must back. My view is 
that um, for people with chronic conditions, our aspiration should be very simple, which is to achieve a revolution in care, the equivalent of the revolution in mental health care between the 1960s and the end of the end of the last century, and we should be able to look back in 2030 and wonder why on earth we thought it was the right thing to do for people like my dad and then me to shuffle people in and out of hospital with tens of thousands of hospital beds around the country dedicated to that. And we'll, have a, we'll try and engineer off the back of that long, painful study, which, by the way, we believe unequivocally shows, will show the evidence is right, and people will still quibble with, because that's the... That's the game. Evidence is used as much as an opposition to change as a driver for it. Secondly, and I think this is critical, which is to recognise there are things we want to innovate at where the standard of evidence is not the same. It's not the same. Um, and we should have a way of putting things in the hopper, which doesn't mean they have to go through four years of £10 million worth of um, what will ultimately be disputed trials anyway, and that we need to use the judgement about which things to back and to make those happen. That's where I'm asking for help, because it's not a simple problem. We, you and I agree, and I think you're an extraordinary person, Lionel, but I've, I've had hundreds of people who look a bit like you through my door, each clutching their solution. And I'm not capable of discriminating, and I know the wrong thing to do is to remit that to huge bureaucratic multi-year processes. So a shared intellectual challenge is this hopper problem of how we rapidly make decisions about um, how the system is set up to disseminate innovations that don't require that standard of evidence but do need some push. And I'm not sure we've quite... The, the Innovation Review will identify the issue and I think we need to quickly solve it. One more question, then we'll have to move Sorry, on. Sorry, very yep. long answers. Just hang on for the microphone. Mm -hmm. It's for the network. You got that? Yep, OK. Um, the question is, there is a large hopper... Uh, and it is hard to make the choices, but, but one of the things with that is that people have lots of technologies that don't necessarily have a market need. So can you comment a bit more about how you do the, the backing of the, uh, the right horses? How, how are you going to um, define what the need is that, that organisations can respond to and make use, hopefully, of things like the SBRI model? It's a great question. So I think, um, I think we will be able to be much clearer about where we're looking for innovation, and it'll be in basically two things. One is the outcomes framework. So the outcomes framework will define those things that the NHS will be focusing on in turning its £110 billion into better health. So the job of the commissioning board is to take £110 billion and to turn it into better health, by which it means primarily the things in the outcomes framework, the five domains. It's a broad spectrum, actually. And secondly, those things have to add financial value, they have to be affordable in themselves or release other value in order to be innovated. So it's the combination of those two things. Um, unfortunately, in a way, I don't think that's particularly restrictive. Um, and there will be people who get unhappy about it because it isn't quite where they are. So there are still issues in there about being selective about what makes a difference. I think the, uh, the tools to evaluate the affordability are often weak and underdeveloped or require us to unlock value. I think we have to move away from buying widgets and pills towards buying services. Um, we're very bad at turning technological innovation into service change together. And it's only in service change that the medical and the economic value of the innovation are realized. And so I think we need to do some of that. So the outcomes framework plus the economics is where we're at. Um, but we still need help with the, the, the non-bureaucratic toolkit which may include things like judgment for knowing, or guesswork, no, judgment for knowing which things to go for. Well, Jim, thanks very much indeed. We'll, we'll watch with uh, interest what, what sort of progress uh, you make.